just expect it, Harvard or anybody in the room. Judy. <laughs> She's not cheap. Not cheap, but good, right? We're worth it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, good morning, everybody. All right. Well, um, let's see. Thank everyone who donated to the Community Link Holiday Boxes. We were able to deliver over a hundred completely filled boxes for distribution. And they have uh, had some churches return boxes that were unable to be filled. Uh, that should leave us uh, humbled by God's provision and grateful for such a generous church. And holiday schedules, we all know that uh, candlelight Christmas Eve service will be at 5 p.m. And, uh, uh, and on December the 25th, we'll have 11 o'clock service. And on January the 1st, we will have 11 o'clock service and we won't have our Bible fellowship groups. So celebrate recovery, still going on 7 p.m. each Tuesday night and uh, still opportunities to get involved. Um, just contact Cheryl McCarson or Robert Burroughs and uh, uh, our first snack packs for the new year will take place on Tuesday, January the 10th at 10 o'clock in the church atrium. So between now and then, we need lots of non-perishable, non-peanut snacks to go in the, uh, into the snack pack bags for the Berkshire Elementary kiddos. Okay, that is all the announcements that I have. Um, I had a prayer request that came to us from Joyce McCarson. And Joyce, of course, is living on the west side of town now. And she was asking us to pray for her while she looks for a new church home. And uh, she, uh, she shared that uh, uh, they had visited a couple of churches and they were just looking, waiting for the one that felt right. And uh, so she shared with me that She's really pleased where TD is. Um, uh, it's close to her. She's able to go and spend time there. And uh, TD seems to be happy. Um, and uh, so she, she shared that the other day they were having a uh, decorating party for uh, uh, for gingerbread houses and 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 TD ate the gumdrops that were supposed to go on, <laughs> on the gingerbread houses. She so. said the nice thing about they just go with the flow. You know, yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. Nobody gets upset. He doesn't get upset. Right. He uh, TD's just a gentle giant. Great man, great man. All right. Well, any prayer requests from anyone or updates? I'm taking you off the prayer list. You, you, you inform me that you you're you're good. You want to be you off. Probably should have waited to January the fourth because they do another scope on January the fourth. I'm well, just now and then, as far as we know, he's clear. I'm <laughs> just I'm just going by what the man told me. 
<laughs> All right. All right. Well, let me go to the Lord and then we'll turn it over to Mr. Mark. Tommy Elliott appreciate prayers for William. Okay. He is another which he's been on the list, but he is in a lot of pain. Went this week to see the orthopedic doctor, and when he got there, then he got there around three, and the doctor had just left. But he'd been waiting for weeks to see it. So uh, he's supposed to go back this Thursday, but just pray that he'll get to see that doctor. Yeah. Because he's, he's in a lot of pain, and I'm concerned about his face, you know, about, with all of this. I know it's self-inflicted his back baggage but god is merciful you know, yeah you yeah. know that he's trying to hopefully be when his heart seems to be open but at times he gets awfully depressed and i want the generic kind of thing that the for, for a lot of people christmas is on Sadness comes up. Things are not what they remember. Yeah. 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 All right. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this season, which is all about you sending your son to take away our sins and to give us hope and salvation. Father, be with our members and our friends this time of year. Uh, many are suffering with medical needs. Uh, also, this is a a tough time of year for some people. Um, loved ones that have gone on um, and uh, I just pray that you would be with them. And Jesus, it's in your holy name I pray. Amen. All right. All right, Mr. Mark. Thank you. Good to see everyone this morning. Uh, several days ago, Pastor Stewart uh, sent uh, an email to the Bible Fellowship Group teachers, and he said, "Well, he said, you know, we're we're not going to have Bible Fellowship groups on Christmas Day and on New Year's Day." So he said, "You you can teach." whichever of the three lessons you want, today's lesson or the lesson for the 25th or the lesson for the first. And so I thought, well, okay. And then I thought, you know, we ought to have a Christmas lesson for sure. And so I, that's why I had Tommy send out the email to you saying that we would uh, do the Christmas day lesson today. And so when I came in this morning, Pastor Stewart greeted me and he said, uh, which lesson are you teaching? I said, oh, the lesson for Christmas on Luke chapter two. He said, I knew it. I knew you'd do that. <laughs> well, it just makes sense, doesn't it? At Christmas time, we ought, to, uh, we ought to study a Christmas lesson and what a blessing it is to do that. Well, when you think about it, Luke chapter one Luke chapter 2, and really the whole gospel is based on memories. Uh, in the beginning of the gospel of Luke, Luke said, I made a careful investigation so that I could write an orderly account. And if you read the gospel of Luke uh, from start to finish, you'll see that it is very orderly. It's, it's very logical. It's very methodical. And obviously, Luke did a lot of careful research. Now, think about what's in Luke chapter 1. There's the story of how the angel appeared to Zacharias. 
and said, your wife, Elizabeth, will be with child. And he said, how can that be? We're too old. But it was. And then we have the story how the angel appeared to Mary and said, you're going to be with child and be the mother of the Messiah. So where did Luke get that information? Most Bible scholars are convinced that Luke interviewed Mary, that Mary was, was still living, and that Luke interviewed her. And much of what we have in Luke chapter 1 is actually Mary's memories that Luke recorded. Because there are things revealed there in uh, Luke chapter 1 uh, that only Mary would have known. Only Mary would have known. And it's just, it just marvelous. And, so, and really, that, that's what the whole book of Luke is. Luke wasn't an eyewitness to the life and ministry of Jesus. Uh, he was converted in the ministry of Paul 20 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. And so what Luke discovered, he discovered by interviewing people and asking them to tell their memories. And so really what we have here in the gospel of Luke is a memory book, a memory book. And aren't we glad that he did that research and talked to all those eyewitnesses and, and we have all these wonderful accounts and stories and miracles and teachings. It's so wonderful. And uh, we believe firmly the Holy Spirit uh, inspired Luke to, to do his uh, investigation, to do his research. And then we believe the Holy Spirit guided Luke to record accurately uh, what, what the Lord wanted recorded in his gospel. So I thought it'd be fun to start this, this morning's lesson by just sharing some of our Christmas memories, our Christmas memories. And, and as we say up in the Ozarks, I'll prime the pump. Yeah, Henry knows what I'm talking about there. Yeah. When I was a little boy, we went to this little church up in the Ozarks uh, in Arkansas. And every year Christmas time, uh, they would take us children around to Carol to do caroling for the shut-ins. And, you know, there, there were several. And so they would drive us from home to home and we would sing Christmas carols. And then afterwards, uh, they'd bring us back to the church and uh, serve us home-baked cookies and hot chocolate uh, that they made in a big vat. This was long before Swiss Miss, you have to understand. <laughs> and that's one, of my, that's one of my precious memories is going caroling. Uh, as a child there in the Ozarks. Well, what's a memory that you have? A Christmas memory. In college, we went caroling with our high church and uh, we finished about 2, 3 a.m. Oh, <laughs> I mean, it went yeah. on and on. And every place we went, they fed it. So, oh, sure. Uh, and it wasn't just cookies, you know, it was food. It was food. Uh, and uh, it was quite an evening, quite an event, because uh, the Thai young people love to sing. There you go. Yeah. All right, very good. So all night caroling, all right? That's a, that's a good memory. You won't forget that. Someone else? Well, Christmas morning at my house growing up, I had three young sisters, and um, we would get up, and they would rush into the living room to see what Santa had brought them. And Dad started a tradition I guess, as far back as I can remember. And uh, he always made hot chocolate on Christmas morning. So uh, just so fond memories you think of this time of the year too. So. All right, someone else. Well, at our house on Christmas Eve, uh, my granddad, my mother's dad would come and um, we would have our family Christmas and uh, usually had ham sandwiches or something like that. 
And then we'd get our presents from Santa on Christmas morning. And one year I had wanted a bicycle. And when I got up Christmas morning, I had a bicycle, but it's kind of rusted here, a spot or two. And my dad said, well, that's because it came all the way from the North Pole. <laughs> 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 no. So that later, it was a secondhand, <laughs> secondhand bicycle. But anyway, the other Christmas tradition was my dad made from scratch fruit salad every Christmas. And our kids, when we came back from furlough one year, our boy said, Mother, could you make some fruit salad like Papa used to make? And I was like, oh, goodness, that was so much fun. I mean, you know, peeling the oranges and cutting them in the carrots and all of that kind of stuff. But anyway, that's what we, I remember, and that's what our boys remember. Okay. All right, someone else, then we'll, then we'll move on. We had a, our youth group when I was a kid, I was young, I don't know how old I was, I was old enough to get in trouble. <laughs> but, uh, we, uh, we went to Carolyn to a, a care center, and back then it was, uh, you know, the turtleneck stuff was was a big deal. I had a black turtleneck, and uh, so we got into the do the caroling. Well, this dude was lady was there, and and she thought I was a priest. Oh. <laughs> yeah. she, was, she was wanting to make confession to me. <laughs> So I just went along with the program. <laughs> <laughs> that one I <laughs> oh my goodness. So did you absolve her? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I said you're okay. <laughs> <laughs> that may be that may be against the law in Louisiana, Henry. I don't know. For yeah. penance, you can go to the Baptist church. Yeah. There you go. There, there you go. <laughs> Well, these these memories we have of Christmas, I mean, they're just they're just precious, and uh, it seems like our childhood memories uh, linger with us and, and mean so much to us. And of course, uh, one thing I've discovered it it's uh, it's such a blessing to make Christmas for my grandchildren. Up in the Ozarks, we talk about making Christmas, and it's just a blessing to make Christmas uh, for our. Our grandchildren, Barbara told me the other day, she said, you've got to stop buying presents. You bought enough now. <laughs> well, I don't know if that's even possible, but <laughs> but uh, she she handles our bookkeeping. So I'll have to have to listen to Miss Barbara, I guess. Well, in Luke chapter one, we read about two miraculous births. You know, we think about the virgin birth of Jesus, and, and certainly that was miraculous. But actually, there was another miraculous birth. Uh, the conception of John the Baptist. Uh, his parents, uh, Zacharias and Elizabeth, were far past the normal age for childbearing. And so that was a miraculous birth that was announced by, uh, by the angel. And then, of course, Gabriel appeared uh, to Mary and announced to her that she would, she would give birth uh, to the Messiah. And in both cases, uh, the power of Almighty God overcame the limitations of human biology. Uh, Judy's a nurse, and she'd say, well, you know, things like this don't happen. But in God's economy, in God's precious plan, they did. And so we have two miraculous births, uh, both announced by angels. And then in our text for today, uh, Luke 2, 1 through 15, we have a third pronouncement uh, by an angel that appeared uh, to the shepherds in the field outside of Bethlehem. And so we see lots of angelic activity here in the Christmas story. Well, what is the, what's the job of angels anyway? What, we talked about angels in the sermon this morning. Uh, what, what do angels do for the Lord? Messengers. All right, they're messengers. All right, what else? Think of protectors, our yeah, yeah. You may remember the story of uh, Elisha, and and he was going to be attacked, and his servant, you know, got up and said, you know, I see this army out here. Yeah. Sometimes there are protectors. Someone said to me one time in church, they said, Brother Mark, do you believe in guardian angels? And I said, I certainly do. My son survived to adulthood. So I do believe, I do believe in guardian angels. 
And Will and Darlene can tell you why I said that. All right, they'll testify. <laughs> but we see lots of, lots of activity by angels. And in the Christmas story, uh, they're basically fulfilling their role as messengers, messengers, carrying God's message. Remember very well celebrating Christmas in uh, Malaysia, and uh, we were part of Lijian Baptist Church, which was a Chinese church, and we were helping them start an English-speaking congregation in the church, and so we were part of Lijian Baptist Church, and I remember our pastor, Chinese pastor, Pastor Anthony, remarking, he said, in the Christmas story, everyone did what they were told. You read the Christmas story, everyone obeyed. Everyone did what they were told. Mary agreed to do what the Lord wanted her to do. Joseph agreed to do what he was instructed to do. Everyone did what they were instructed to do by the Lord. And it surely did work out great, didn't it? So wonderful. All right, someone read for us a verses uh, one through three, Luke chapter two, verses one through three. Who can read the first three verses? In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole empire should be registered. The first registration took place while Quirinius, yeah, Quirinius was governing Syria. So everyone went to be registered, each to his own town. All right. So in those days, that means after, after the birth of uh, John the Baptist. And by that point, uh, Mary would have been uh, pregnant for some time. And the Caesar, Caesar Augustus, uh, ordered that all the, all the Roman Empire should be registered. Uh, now, it, it, uh, King James talks about a census. Well, it, in a sense, it was a census. They wanted, to, they wanted to count all the people, but it wasn't just to get a count. They wanted everyone to register so that they could tax them. And so this was basically for uh, taxation purposes. And, and in uh, the area of Italy or Rome itself, they wanted they wanted registration so they could draft uh, soldiers. And so a decree went out uh, from Caesar Augustus that everybody would go and be registered. And this took place during the time when Quirinius was governor of Syria. It's interesting, for, for many years, uh, Bible critics, uh, people who are negative or have a negative attitude toward the Bible, said, well, this is a mistake in the Bible because Quirinius was not the governor of Syria when Jesus was born. And this was pointed to over and over again as a mistake in the Bible. But then archaeologists found further evidence that actually Quirinius was governor of Syria at two different times. And the critics were wrong. And again, the Bible was proved right. And every person had to go to their hometown uh, to register. And so uh, this was a big deal because it involved every person, every person in the whole Roman Empire. So it's, there were a lot of people being registered and that meant that a lot of people were going to go to where? To Bethlehem. So let's read verses 4 and 5. Someone read verse 4 and 5 for me. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. Okay, so Joseph uh, was in the line. He was a descendant of King David. And so he went back to the city of David, the town of David, which is Bethlehem. Now, 
it's interesting. We've been studying the, the minor prophets and the minor prophet Micah made a prophecy about the birthplace of the Messiah. Someone read Micah chapter five, verse two. Micah chapter five, verse two. Five two, but you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, you are too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose origin is from old, from ancient of days. All right. So it's called the Bethlehem is called the city of David. It's interesting. the The name Bethlehem literally means house of bread. Beth in, in or Beth in Hebrew means house, and lahem is bread. And so there were wheat fields around Bethlehem, and they, they made bread there, so Bethlehem was called that. It was called the house of bread. And uh, it really wasn't a city. It's called the city of David, but it, it wasn't a city. It was a little town, a little town. But that's where, that's where David was from. Of course, you remember Samuel went there, and uh, interviewed all of uh, David's older brothers, and the Lord didn't pick any of them. And finally, Samuel said to Jesse, David's father, he said, do you have any other sons? He said, well, the youngest is out in the field watching the sheep. And Samuel said, well, call him in. And when David appeared before Samuel, the Lord said, this is the one, anoint him. And so Bethlehem, of course, is the, is the city or the a birthplace of David, and Joseph had to go there to be registered uh, because he was in the family line or a descendant of David. Now, Joseph had been living and working where? Nazareth. Now, Barbara and I got to go to the Holy Land in uh, September, and, you know, it's, it's a couple of hours bus, bus ride from Nazareth uh, which is just west of the Sea of Galilee, down to Bethlehem. Bethlehem is about five miles uh, south of Jerusalem. And so this, is, uh, this was uh, some distance. So it would have taken uh, Joseph and Mary uh, sometime, several days, three or four days. Um, now, in all of the pictures that we see, we see Mary riding on a donkey. Does it mention a donkey? Now, doesn't mention. I hope she did get to ride on the donkey because uh, uh, she was great with child, as we say. So I hope she did get to get to ride a donkey from uh, from Nazareth to Bethlehem because that was that was quite a quite a trick, quite a walk. And so Mary was with Joseph. She was great with child. Uh, the Christian Standard Bible says that she was engaged to him. Uh, the King James says she was, and I believe the, someone had the ESV, said she was betrothed to him. Uh, Jewish marriage customs very different than ours. Many times uh, when a girl baby was born, an arranged marriage, uh, a marriage would be arranged. Uh, they arranged marriages. They thought marriage was much too important to leave to young people to decide. Now, a lot of cultures, actually more cultures in the world are that way even today uh, than, than you pick your own as we do. Uh, but they would, they would betroth, the family would betroth a, a young girl, very, very young girl to a man. And typically uh, the girls married as teenagers, but typically the men married uh, at a more mature age when they had established themselves in their job, in their work, in their vocation. And so it, it's very likely that Joseph was about 30 years of age and Mary was about 15. So uh, Joseph would have been uh, much older. And so he and, he and Mary had, had been betrothed or engaged. Betrothal in, in, in uh, the Jewish custom was, was more more than engagement, they were considered married, but they didn't consummate 
their marriage until after the wedding ceremony itself. So it, it's kind of hard to describe in, in terms of our American culture, but it was, they were like super engaged. You know, it, it was like, uh, it was like engagement on steroids. And uh, they were considered married, uh, but they weren't intimate until after, after the uh, marriage uh, ceremony, which was uh, like a week long series of banquets and activities. Yeah, one reason we know that too is because it's, uh, Job said he'd have to divorce her. Yeah. In order to yeah. end the, the legal relationship. Yeah, that's exactly right. And we sort, you know, um, we don't do that uh, here, in, here in the United States. But that's, that's well taken, which is seminary speak for that's a good point. <coughs> a lot of times uh, at the engagement, that would be the first time they meet. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it could well be. As I said, they, the, the, uh, the marriages were arranged. Yeah. Uh, will and Darlene will remember this. When, when we served in the Philippines, the churches, the Baptist Union in Bangladesh started sending students to study at the Philippine Baptist Seminary in Baguio. And they sent several over the years. Well, they didn't want to send these young men as bachelors. So the president of the Baptist Union in Bangladesh would arrange for this Baptist young man to marry a Baptist young woman. And he would, the president of the Baptist Union would do some, you know, he, he'd do some calling and checking and find out, you know, you know, where is there a, a suitable young Baptist girl who could marry this male student that was about to go off to the seminary in the Philippines. And so they would get married and then leave for the Philippines the next day. And typically they had never met until they saw each other in the church to be married. And so they'd get married the next day, they'd get on the plane, fly the Philippines, and, you know, he would start his classes at the seminary there in Baguio. And, and I was up there one time, and uh, some of the missionary ladies uh, there at the seminary were, were laughing. I said, what are you laughing about? They said, well, it's so much fun to watch a married couple fall in love. <laughs> <laughs> but arranged marriages. Uh, it seems strange to us in our culture, but that was the norm. And certainly that was true for Mary and Joseph. And the fact that she was pregnant before they had come together, before the actual wedding ceremony had taken place, was, was going to be a big scandal. And that's why she went to stay with her cousin Elizabeth uh, for several months, I'm sure. It would have been very difficult for her back in Nazareth. But uh, Joseph, as Will reminded us, was, a, was at the point of divorcing her because he knew he wasn't the reason uh, she was pregnant. And so he thought, well, I'll put her away quietly uh, to try to avoid as much scandal and shame as possible. But, of course, the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, don't be afraid to take her as your wife. This is all of the Lord. The Holy Spirit did this. And so, as we said, Joseph obeyed. And, you know, we focus a lot on Mary, and, and I think that's appropriate. I've often thought the Roman Catholics make too much of Mary. We make too little. Mary must have been just a marvelous person. Now, just think about that. To think that God chose her to be Jesus' mother, to bear the Messiah. What an honor. And she must have been truly a wonderful girl that God chose her. God chose her. And how did she respond when the angel said, you're the one? She said, behold, the handmaiden of the Lord. In other words, I'm your servant. Whatever you say, I will do. And she knew very well. Knew very well what that implied. Yeah, there's nothing like living in a small town. Oh, yes. <laughs> I mean... People of our generation knew what that meant to be an unwed mother in our time growing up. And just imagine in, in Israel 2,000, 2000 years ago. But she could have been stoned. Yeah, she's exactly so. 
according to the law of Moses, if Joseph had made it uh, a thing, big thing yeah. yeah, if he had made a big deal out of it, she could have been stoned. That's exactly right. And so uh, Mary, Mary obeyed the Lord and, and she was just marvelous. But Joseph, for his part, yeah. what an honor to be chosen as the, as the father, the, the man to raise the Lord Jesus. You can also imagine what a lot of the people were saying when they knew that Mary was pregnant and Joseph most likely wasn't her father, but then Joseph takes her yeah. anyway. I mean, I'm sure he I'm sure he came in for lots of criticism yeah. and and you talk about tongues wagging. Uh, that would probably be a great understatement in Nazareth. But if any of you have seen uh, why the nativity that Dr. David Jeremiah has put out, it's on YouTube. Okay. It's, brief. it's a 90 minute uh, movie. It's quite incredible. And to see Mary was quite touching to me. Yeah. Sweet. Just, yeah. just our my admiration for Mary and Joseph, it just really knows no bounds. Uh -huh. I, didn't, I don't even know how to express it. To think the, the role they were chosen to play in this drama of redemption and how well they did. And uh, we, uh, uh, we owe them a great debt of gratitude for their obedience to the Lord and their faithfulness to the Lord. So uh, they went to Bethlehem uh, and we've learned that that was the place that, uh, where David was born and the prophet had predicted that the Messiah would be born there. And you remember when the wise men came to King Herod and said, you know, we're looking for this king that's to be born. They said, where will this king be born? <coughs> so Herod consulted the, the scribes and they said, oh, Bethlehem. And they quoted uh, Micah chapter five, verse two. So the wise men uh, made, their way to, made their way to Bethlehem. All right, someone read verses six and seven. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth. Then she <coughs> gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him tightly in cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no guest room. Well, the innkeeper has come in for a lot of criticism over the years. Was it his fault that the inn was already full? No. Plus, here's a woman who's evidently about the domino. A lot of times that involves hours and hours of of some pretty loud <laughs> hollering and, and 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 a pretty big mess and all and he didn't want to subject all of his clients that were already there so he offered the stables yeah. which was far enough away that it probably wasn't going to disturb a lot of people so uh, he provided the innkeeper provided a place for them which was in the which was in the stable uh, if you go to the <coughs> the Church of the Nativity uh, in Bethlehem. In the Holy Land, there are some sites that are certain. We can be certain that is the place uh, where something happened. Other places, they're not sure. Uh, it may be this place, maybe another place, like, like where Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River. You know, several different places have been mentioned. No one knows for sure. There, there's just there's no way to identify it precisely, but the Church of the Nativity, there's no doubt, that's the oldest oldest church uh, in the world, and this church goes back uh, almost almost two thousand years, and so it it is certainly certainly the place. And if you go into the Church of the Nativity, you you go down into what was a cave. Yeah, it was a cave. Now, you know, we think of it, as, you know, as a little wooden stable, uh, but actually it was a, it was a cave and the manger uh, wasn't a wooden 
a manger like in <laughs> all the Christmas cards, but rather it was a hewn stone. And uh, you can see that today. And so uh, Mary gave birth to Jesus. And the, the teachers uh, quarterly mentioned that there may have been a midwife there. And I never really thought about that, but but that would make sense because we know that normally uh, the Jewish people did use midwives. So very likely uh, Joseph did ask the innkeeper to call for uh, the midwife to come and help with, with the birth of Jesus. <coughs> when Jesus was born, she wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in the manger. Now, We've all read that and heard that all of our lives in the, in the Christmas story. That's a thing now. Judy's nodding her head. Swaddle. Swaddle a baby? They've relearned it. Yeah, it, 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 it's a genius thing. Just <laughs> but it just, it just means to wrap, wrap the baby tightly. And it makes them warm and secure. And, yeah. and uh, she... Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Well, considering he was laying in a rock. Yeah, yeah it, was it was good. <laughs> good, to, good to swaddle him. Yeah. And the reason they had to go to the, uh, to the stable was that there were just so many people there to register that had preceded them that everything was full. And, you know, all of us in our life experience have experienced that. You know, you're trying to get a room and everything's full. And, you know, we could, we could tell stories about that. Uh, but thankfully, there was a place. And what strikes us about the birth of Jesus is how humble it was. How humble it was. Just imagine the king of kings was born in a stable and laid in a feed trough. That's the West Texas translation. <laughs> and that's what it was. You know, we say manger, and that, that makes it sound, you know, uh, gentle. more gentle, nicer, but uh, in West Texas or Western Oklahoma, they would say they laid him in a feed trough, and that's exactly, exactly what it was. Well, when Jesus was born, what happened? Look at verse 8. Someone read verse 8 for us. Well, there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. All right, well, why did, they, why did they need to keep watch over their flocks? Wolves. Yeah. Predators. Yeah, there were predators. Yeah, exactly so. And a lot of them are active at night. And so it was essential for the shepherds to, to guard their sheep from animal predators and human thieves as well. The sheep aren't particularly intelligent. No, they, they're not. They're not. They're probably and that's why the Bible often compares us to <laughs> the sheep of God's flock. That's, that's, not, that's not a praise. Yes, they were probably taking turns. I just yeah, probably so. Yeah, 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 probably so. Now, what a lot of people don't realize is that Bethlehem was where the sacrificial lambs were raised. There were special herds of sheep there in Bethlehem, and that's where they raised the lambs that were taken to the temple uh, for sacrifice in the temple. And so uh, that, that's just a, a beautiful picture, and it foreshadows, foreshadows what John would say about Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So the shepherds were out in the field, and Barbara and I got to see the Got to see the shepherd's field when we were in Israel. You know what it looks like? A field, a field yeah. yeah. Just a hillside. <laughs> just a hillside. All right, verse 9. Someone read verse 9. Then the angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around, around them, and they were terrified. Well, you would be too. <laughs> just imagine you're out there doing your job out in the field and suddenly there's this terrific bright, bright shiny light and an angel speaking to you. We didn't have city lights. It was, no, <laughs> it was dark, dark, dark. And they were shocked, shocked, shocked uh, by the light and by the voice of the angel. One thing we 
we read about in the Bible is the glory of God. And you remember when Moses met with God, the glory of God was so bright that Moses' face shone. And he had to put a veil over his face because the people said, we can't bear to look at you because your face shines. Well, his face shined because it was reflecting the glory of God. In theology, we tell the students that the glory of God is the sum of all of God's characteristics. If you could combine all the attributes, all the characteristics of God, if you combine them all together, that's the, the glory of God. <coughs> and if you read in the, the chap, early chapters, especially of Revelation, it talks about how the radiance of God's glory there in the throne room of heaven. And so we read about that over and over again in the Bible. And, and naturally, the angels uh, terrified uh, the poor shepherds. All right, verse 10 and 11. Someone read 10 and 11. Says, and the angel said to them, fear not. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. All right. Yeah, the uh, Christian Standard Bible that they have printed here in the quarterly says, Today in the city of David, a Savior was born to you who is the Messiah, the Lord. So. We've already talked about that Bethlehem is the city of David, and the angel's saying, look, you don't, you know, you didn't know, but this night, a Savior has been born. The Messiah has been born there in Bethlehem. And the angel mentioned three titles of Jesus. What were they? Savior. All right, Savior. Messiah. Messiah. Lord. Lord. Okay. Now, the angel told Joseph that he should name the child what? Jesus. Jesus. Now, the name Jesus means Savior, Savior of his people. It's a, it's a form of the Hebrew name Joshua or Heshua. And so, and so Jesus was born to be our Savior, and he also was born as the Messiah. Now, the Hebrew word Messias literally means anointed one. And in ancient Israel, the, a new king would be anointed by the high priest, showing that he was God's chosen servant. And so the Messiah was the anointed one of God, the chosen one. Of course, many, many prophecies in the Old Testament speak about the coming Messiah. And when we say Jesus Christ, Christos, Christ, it simply translates the Hebrew word Messiah, the Messias. So, so when you say Jesus Christ, you're literally saying Jesus the Messiah. So there in the city of David was born a, a baby who was the Savior, the Messiah, the promised one of God, who fulfilled all the Old Testament prophecies, and the Lord. And Jesus is the Lord. In fact, the book of Revelation said he's the king of kings and Lord of lords. And that means he's our master. He's our master. It's interesting, isn't it? A lot of people want Jesus as their savior. They're not so keen to make Jesus their master, make Jesus their Lord. But that's what it's about. Well, what are some other titles that the Bible gives to Jesus? Can you think of some other titles? The light. All right, light, teacher, teacher. counselor, counselor. Prince, of prince of peace, mighty king, mighty king. Go back to Isaiah. There's a whole yeah chapter. <laughs> yeah, wonderful counselor, prince of peace. All right, there's some in Revelation. I'll give you a little hint. Think hard. Mm -hmm. Lamb of God. Way, truth, and life. All right. Yeah, Jesus' favorite title for himself was Son of Man. 
uh, which uh, which comes from uh, Daniel chapter seven, messianic prophecy. In Daniel chapter seven, talks about the Son of Man. Jesus referred to himself as the Son of Man. Mark ten forty five. For the Son of Man did not come to to be served, but to serve and to give himself as a ransom for many. Yeah. Uh, how about Lion of the Tribe of Judah? Yeah. Yeah. So there, there are lots more besides. And one Bible commentator said, well, the Bible gives us many names, many titles for Jesus, because one title can't do him justice. One title can't do him justice. And it's, it's like looking at a diamond, isn't it? You know, one of the interesting things about a, a, a cut diamond is that you look at it from different angles, different perspectives, and it, it changes appearance. It refracts the light in different ways. And that's the characteristic of a well-cut well -cut gem. We understand that. <coughs> I think that's the way the, the way the Lord Jesus is. All these different titles are different angles, different ways we can look at the Lord Jesus and understand another truth another aspect of his wonderful being. So he said in verse 12, this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped tightly in cloth and lying in a manger. So it wasn't unusual to wrap a baby in swaddling clothes, but how many babies in Bethlehem were lying in a manger? Just one. <laughs> he said, uh, and he said, this will be a sign. You I mean, this is how you'll know you found the right baby. Uh, he'll be wrapped in swaddling clothes and he'll be the one that's in a manger. And so uh, uh, they went to Jerusalem and inquired, you know, was a baby born here tonight? And they looked, looked for one that was uh, a lion in a manger and they found him, found him. And they obeyed. The angel said, go to Bethlehem and see, and they did. Someone read verses 13 and 14 for us. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Okay, yep. So the one angel, made the announcement to them, and then the heavenly host appeared. And heavenly host really refers to the army of God. In fact, one of the titles of God in the Old Testament is Lord of hosts, meaning God of armies. And so here, the angel army, this host of angels, we call it the angel choir. Does it say that? Does it say that they sang? No, it doesn't say it. Now, maybe they did. That uh, doesn't say that. Uh, the word saying praising God actually doesn't mean singing. It's more like uh, announcing or, uh, you know, the, uh, there are things that choirs do that are not sung, but they're, they're chanted or they're, they're shouted. What I'm trying to remember the name of that. Uh, I remember we did that one time years ago. Uh, but However they did it, whether they sang it or shouted it, what did they say? Glory to God. Yeah, glory to God. And what should we say? Glory to God. I mean, you know, we're not like the old-fashioned Baptist I knew up in the Ozarks, but, you know, sometimes they'd get happy in Jesus. They'd say, glory. Praise the Lord. Or even amen. Just imagine. People say amen in church. Well, what, what can we do? I mean, we just, we're like the shepherds. We're in awe at what God has done. And we just say glory, glory to God. Glory to God. It's amazing. It's amazing. So a multitude of the heavenly hosts, they were praising God and saying glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to people he favors. So where does God live? In heaven. So they're saying, praise God here, praise God there, praise God everywhere. Glory to him. And then they said, this is peace on earth 
to people that he favors, or to all people, King James says. There's discussion. Was he talking about just all the people in the world? Was he talking about all the Jewish people? The King James, oh, King James says goodwill to men. Uh, the ESV, English Standard Version, we use here in our church, says those with whom he is pleased. The NIV says on whom his favor rests. And the Christian Standard Bible says peace on earth to people he favors. I'm going to give this the missionary interpretation and say this is good news to all the peoples of the world. And that's one of the great things. That's one of the marvelous things about being a missionary is that you have the, the wonderful opportunity to tell the gospel to people for whom it is news. Yes. Not just news, but good news. And that's the miracle. The gospel is good news. It's good news about good news. And, you know, you've heard people say, well, that's news to me, meaning I never heard that before. <coughs> but we hear, here in America, we hear the gospel so much. I, there are people now for, to whom it is news. It's, it's new information to them, much more so than, than when we were young. But for two thirds of the world's population, for many of them, they've never heard this, never heard this. And so for them, it is what? Good news. To all the peoples, all the peoples of the earth. So verse 15. Someone read that. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. Now, just imagine the privilege those shepherds had to go and worship the baby Jesus. Just amazing. First ones. The first worshipers. Yeah. The first worshipers. You said, you know, the quarters of this straight. They went straight. Yeah, straight down. That's yeah. what I like it. And I guess they left all their sheep. Just left them in the field. Maybe, maybe the mm -hmm. host of angels. Maybe. <laughs> no, they went straight to Bethlehem to see. And that's what we should do. That's what we should do. Go and see. Go and see. Yeah. Some years ago, we were serving in the Philippines, and Barbara was the uh, working in the library there. She was the library consultant. Uh, which meant she told her how to do things. And <laughs> she has her master's degree in library science. So she, she really was a professional librarian. And so and that's on the mission field. That's, that's a rare, a rare ruby to be sure. And there was a young Chinese wife who worked in the library as a clerk and she was great with child. And I happened to pass her on the sidewalk one day there at the seminary. And I said, oh, when is your baby due? And she gave me a big smile and she said, one month. I can't wait to see my baby's face. And I thought, why? Oh, I never thought of it that way. She carried that baby under her heart for eight months, but she'd never seen the baby's face. But just imagine Mary. She must have wondered, what will the Messiah look like? She had never seen her baby's face. But that night in Bethlehem, the Lord Jesus was born. And Mary got to see his face. The face of Jesus. Our Savior. Our Messiah our Lord. And what did the angels say? Peace on earth to people he favors. And that's what Jesus came to provide. Jesus came to provide us with peace with God. Through Jesus Christ, people who are alienated, who are separated from God by their sin, can have peace 
with God himself. Yeah. Jesus made that possible. Put a note in that referred to John 14, 27. Because it says, Jesus talking says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. How does the world change? Now, Paul said there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He came to mediate our sin problem, make it possible for us to have peace with God and to know the peace of God. And when people know and have peace with God, then they can be at peace with themselves. Let me just mention this. Uh, we often talk about the, the, the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, and we should. We should. I mean, we couldn't talk about it enough. You know, we think about the, how Jesus suffered and died on the cross, and we should. We should. We should. We, we should talk about it, teach it, preach it, share it. But Jesus also sacrificed by being born, by coming to us. Just imagine just imagine the prince of heaven who had known nothing but the splendor of heaven coming to earth to be born in a cave where they kept the animals. And the king of kings was laid in a feed trough to sleep his first night. Amazing. We don't, we don't talk enough, we don't meditate enough about the sacrifice Jesus made when he came to be born with us. But he came to be Emmanuel. There's another title. None of us mentioned that. He came to be Emmanuel, which means what? And that night, God came to be with us. The Son of God became a man so that he could redeem us from our sins. Incredible. He was the creator of the universe. That's one of mother's favorite hymns was Out of the Ivory Palaces. Yeah. Out of the Ivory Palaces into this world of woe. Yeah. 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 All right. Anyone else? Yes. Um, I've kept this for many years. I was going to share it with you personally, but I'm going to just go ahead and share it. <laughs> um, one Christmas at Baguio, Jim Slack brought the message to the little church, Calvary Church. Yeah, there. sure. And he said, open your Bibles to Philippians 2. Can you imagine how well? No, it's, it's Luke 2. You know, yeah. two. <laughs> but then verses, well, actually began with 5 through 11. Yeah covers his birth, his death, and his resurrection. Can I read it? Sure. How this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, as he already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant and being born in the likeness of men. And being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, death on a cross. For this reason, also God highly exalted him and bestowed him the name which is above every name, so that at that name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Well, we confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And like the angels, we say, glory to God in the highest. Glory to God in the highest. Glory, glory. Yeah. Anyone else? Can I interrupt again? Well, sure. <laughs> <laughs> You're anyone. <laughs> uh, I mentioned guardian angels a while ago, and I had a flashback. We had several families that came to us to the Philippines when they had to leave Vietnam. 
And one of the couples told us, well, there was actually two couples at the time, but one of the couples told us that they got word one night that the communists were coming in and they said, get out. But they didn't have time to get out. And so they just kind of hunkered down and prayed. And they waited and they waited. And daylight came and they waited and no one came. And I don't remember exactly how it came about, but they were talking with one of the town officials or someone. Yeah, it was some captured soldier from North Vietnam. Okay. And they said, we were told you were going to attack this town, but you never did. And he said, oh, we couldn't attack the town. It was already surrounded. And I've heard of an incident also in Africa that happened yeah. that's the same way. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Brother. I had a thought about the connection of the shepherds when David was a shepherd boy chosen and Jesus is of the lineage of David and then the shepherds were the first ones to get the message from the angels about Jesus being born um, kind of a connection there with the oh, yeah. shepherd theme <laughs> Well, John 10, John chapter 10 is all about Jesus, the good shepherd. Yeah. yeah. And, of course, that's what David uh, wrote in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. So shepherds are really, really important in the Bible. And it, it, that, that's interesting in itself because in Israel, they were not, right. not uh, prestigious. <laughs> Being a shepherd was well, it's just about the lowest. Uh, Several notches below women. Yeah, that's <laughs> oh, <laughs> uh, uh, moving right along. <laughs> and Alyssa, I think it said something about the shepherds who are uh, kind of ill repute because sometimes they they killed a sheep and ate it and stuff, and then just told the boss that it that a, a lion killed it or something. Yeah. You know, on a lighter note, and I know it didn't come until later, but the wise men, uh, I have this picture that, that shows the three wise men at the door, and, yeah. and there's a fourth one walking away, and the caption, unbeknownst to most theologians, there was a fourth wise man who was turned away for bringing fruitcake. <laughs> so that, that's your takeaway from <laughs> All right. I always like the appearance of angels. About 90% of the time, all through the Bible, when an angel appears, the first words is, fear not. Yeah. Don't be afraid. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I was talking about the glow from, from Moses' face, you know, after he had been with God up on the mountain. Well, the angels live with God. Mm -hmm. So just think how much they glow. Mm -hmm. and, and it's well taken. All right, Miss Barbara? Well, I was thinking we were in Israel, how they talked about that the shepherds really understood who the baby was because it was in a lying in a manger and that's the way that they treated those lambs when they were born because they were had to be without blemish and so it, 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 that resonated with them that this was the sacrifice right. very good anyone else well i heard once in a sermon and i don't remember who who or when or where uh, that the words fear not or be not afraid appears 365 times in the Bible. Now, I don't know who counted them. But, <laughs> but if you get an exhaustive concordance, you can count. It, uh, that just tells us that yeah. every day yeah. we should not be afraid. Okay. All right, let's pray. So we just thank you for this wonderful uh, lesson that reminds us of uh, the birth of uh, baby Jesus. And Lord, we, we, we thank you for Jesus who came to be our Savior, our Messiah, our Lord. Lord, we just uh, thank you so much for the precious gift of the Christ child. Dismiss us now with your blessing, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. 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 One other thing. I'm going to brag about my youngest grandson. From Friday he graduated from Simmons. To become Lordy. Wow. And we were standing in the lobby waiting and we had the program and I hadn't even looked in the program and they said, Carson has given an invitation. 
Well, he marched okay. on the stage with the professors and the president and all of this. <laughs> and when the president introduced him, he, he was also homecoming queen, a king. <laughs> and he said, I'm, uh, King Carson. Well, no, I called him King Carson. He said, he will always be King Carson. I may not always be president. <laughs> <laughs> and in that prayer, and we're he started off. He gave a he gave an evangelistic sermon. He started off thanking for the school, for the teachers, for the staff, for the mentors, for the parents, and for all that had happened through. And he said, but most of all, and this is a paraphrase, most of all, God, we thank you at this time because you came for a savior to be our savior, and that you're with us and. Through your death, we can be with you. And I don't know, he, I kind of remember a little bit more of it the other day after it happened. But anyway, we're so proud of him. Yeah. yeah. Yes. 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 He had wanted to go to Spain this summer with the IMB, but that didn't work out. But I think someone's had a lot of it in security. I graduated, Lottie, how come? Thank you, Lottie. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <laughs>